in his book of the seven dispensations of the work of Christ and I deal with a few things here. And so let's uh, begin looking at Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 4. Now what we are going to find is the appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, there are a limited number of these personified appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. Whether it be with the appearance of Christ in human form walking with Adam in the cool of the day. Now we have to understand that we're dealing with human form, not human flesh. You had these appearances, and he disposed of these forms at his pleasure and at his will. We find, we'll find different ones, such as when um, he appeared unto Manoah, and we have different ones where he appeared uh, to those within the burning fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar. Each one of these has a particular prophetic principle, and that's what they're for. They are for prophetic, uh, uh, these prophetic appearances have a reason to them. So in the limited number of cases where Christ appeared, whether it be to Abraham uh, before going down into Sodom, before the angels did, there was a reason there for that appearance. And it is prophetically based. And we'll look at a couple of these tonight. And we'll uh, uh, see, uh, hopefully, some interesting truths here in these next few minutes. The Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 4. So the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Now, the following paragraph was written uh, by uh, A.J. Frost, and this, again, are, these are some notes that are taken out of uh, Jagrave's book in regard to the seven dispensations of Christ. Now, he states this. Now, in Christ, there was a divine person acting in a divine and human nature. So we have to realize the appearances, whether it be uh, Christ uh, in the garden, and again, he was in human form, or whether it be Melchizedek, uh, that was an appearance, prophetic appearance of what was to come, or, or the Son of God in the midst of the furnace, walking with... Uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and with them. And there is a prophetic announcement that he would be with his people uh, during the final uh, tribulation to come. And we'll see some of these things. But uh, if frequently the attributes of one nature are attributed to the person. While the person himself is called by name plainly derived from the other nature. For example... The human attributes are predicted of Christ while the person is called by a divine name. And uh, we, let's go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Let's look at a couple of examples here. Right, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Acts chapter 20 verse 28. And uh, the Bible says here, It said, uh, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and... Uh, uh, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. Uh, we see Romans chapter 8, verse 32. In Romans chapter 8 and uh, verse 32, uh, the Bible states here, Romans 8, 32, it says here, it said uh, that he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he uh, not with him also freely give us all things? So we have these uh, different uh, divine attributes that are mentioned and as well as uh, called by a divine name. Now other passages uh, the, uh, the predicate of divine attributes of Christ, while his person is designated by a term purely human, and uh, we see John 3.13 and 6.62 as examples. All these show the union of two natures in one person, and that person divine in all cases. So 
we have human, we have this, uh, the attribute, and of course, uh, his name of a human, but yet that he is divine. And we, we also see where the word became flesh. So let's look at these different appearances of Christ in the Old Testament and how that these were human form and it wasn't human flesh. And then we'll see that the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. So Christ did not come in human flesh until uh, he came, was born of a virgin, and was with man. That's when he came in the flesh. But the other times he came in human form. And these forms appeared, then they were gone. He disposed of them at his pleasure. Now, the frequent manifestations of the second person, the word under the name uh, Jehovah, uh, in the dispensations of the Old Covenant, evidently were, uh, if not all, typically clear images in the incarnation of human flesh. Now, let me back up and go to the verse we started with in Isaiah 40. Now this is where it calls him Jehovah. We see here the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. So the Lord here, the capital L-O-R-D, that is the word used for Jehovah in the Old Testament. And so we know that this is referring to Christ. And as this is referring to Christ, we See what John the Baptist even said, that he was the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. The Bible declares this in the book of Matthew. So we understand that, uh, that the, the divinity of Christ, who he is, that he is, the, he is divine, but yet he has taken upon him at that point human form. So you have divinity now that is robed in human flesh. But the other, the other cases that we look at, uh, these are what we'd understand these appearances are of human form and they're prophetically based. There's a reason for the prophecy concerning this and we'll look at a few of those. So as we've already said, that um, the frequent manifestations of the second person, the word under the name of Jehovah in the dispensations of the old covenant evidently were, if uh, not all typical, clear image of the incarnation in human flesh. For the fulfillment of the various offices as prophet, priest, and king, um, the consummator brings a state of perfection, the covenant of redemption. So these appearances, whether it be Melchizedek, uh, whether it be the Son of God with uh, the three in the fiery furnace, uh, these three are the, um, the these are the fulfillment of various uh, offices. So we see the prophecy of these. So. When you look at the appearance of these human forms of Christ in the Old Testament, whether it be in the cool of the day, when Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. So this is the, uh, the word, but yet it is not in flesh, it is human form. And, and so we're going to see a couple of these, and we're going to see some prophecies surrounding them. And the first one that we're going to deal with is uh, it was Jehovah the Word who walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And uh, somebody give me the verse reference for that, uh, where he walked in the garden in the cool of the day uh, with Adam. So I, when you're looking that up, I'm going to go ahead and read this. Now, uh, it was Jehovah who walked in the garden in the cool of the day and conversed familiar, familiarly uh, with our first parents in their, in a, in a, I'm having this diff innocency, uh, uh, prefiguring the final tabernacling with the redeemed and the beholding his face when the whole earth shall have been made a garden of the Lord. So the reason for this appearance of Christ walking in the cool of the day with Adam, this was a prefigure of his final ta uh, tabern tabernacling, is that a word? Uh, with uh, man in the garden uh, in its finality. You got that reference? Okay, Genesis 3. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Genesis 3 and verse 8. And it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God amongst the trees of the garden. Now, if you will look and, and pay attention here, the word Lord is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Now in the King James Bible, who's, who is 
uh, who is that referring to? Who is the capital L-O-R-D? Remember what we read there in Isaiah. It said, prepare the way of the Lord. And the Lord here in Isaiah uh, 40, verse 3 through 4, who, who, is, I, who is Lord, where it says, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Who, what word, Hebrew word, is that? Jehovah. And so again, we have in Genesis chapter 3, and they walked with Jehovah in the cool of the day. Now, this was, this, as we know that Jesus Christ is the Word. And in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so that Jesus Christ is this Jehovah in flesh. And in the garden here, this is a, an appearance as, as uh, in human form. So it wasn't that God had human flesh or Jehovah had human flesh. This was human form. And we see that human form is used throughout the scripture. And we'll see some other examples as well. Number two, it was Jehovah, the one that was to come, who in human form under the name of Melchizedek, king of righteousness, a priest of the most high God. Now we read this in the book of Genesis dealing with Abraham, when he came back after the slaughter of the kings, remember Lot was taken captive and Lot went and delivered him, or I'm sorry, Abraham did. And Melchizedek met Abraham as he returned from the slaughter of the kings and he offered unto him bread and wine and he blessed him and he received tithes from him. Now, the tithe is New Testament practice because 430 years before Moses in Mount Sinai, the covenant of the New Testament was made. It was confirmed to Abraham. Go to, Galatians, uh, go to Galatians chapter 3, and let's read this. Galatians chapter 3, and then we'll go back to, as we look in the book of Genesis. Galatians 3, and we'll pick up here in verse um, uh, 15. Galatians 3 and verse 15. Galatians chapter 3, verse 15, it says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. Yet, if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth unto. So he's talking about the practice of covenants being confirmed. And if a covenant is confirmed, you can't add to it, you can't take away from it. Now, such as a covenant or a last will and testament, as an example, if you have a last will and testament, it's not added to or taken away. Now, the testator has the power to do so, but uh, let's say the testator who wrote the last will and testament or this covenant desires it to stay as written. And the only thing that will empower it is the death of the testator. But let's look now in verse uh, 16. It says, Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant, which is the New Testament, by the way, was confirmed before of God in Christ. The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So what we see, what Paul is talking about here, is the same thing he's talking about in the book of Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews now, a chapter... Uh, seven. All right, Hebrews chapter 7. Now Melchizedek is this one who met Abraham, and as he met Abraham after the slaughter of the kings, this is when this covenant was confirmed. He had with him bread and wine. Now the bread and wine obviously are a prophetic announcement of the blood that would be shed of the covenant that would establish the covenant, the blood of Christ, and the bread, which is the broken body of Christ, and Christ is the high priest that's going to bring this about. And so this is the prophecy, and Melchizedek was not in human flesh, but he was in human form. And we see what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, it said for, in verse 1, it said, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is uh, king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, 
having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave tithes of the spoil, or a tenth of the spoil. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi, who receive the, uh, the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. That is, their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them that received tithes of Abraham, blessed him that had, that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed to the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them to whom it is witnessed that he liveth. Now let me just explain what has just been read. As, as Abraham, after the slaughter of the kings, met this appearance of, of Jehovah in human form, just as it was in the garden, we have human form. So the prophecy in the garden was that he would tabernacle among his uh, beloved in the end of the garden of God. Now he knew that man would fall into sin, but the important part, when God walked with Adam in the cool of the day, that was a prophecy of, of sharing and how that even though he knew Adam would fall into sin, but that he would eventually tabernacle with his people in the garden of God when all things are made new, when the heaven and earth is made new again, and uh, the city comes down from heaven as we read in the book of Revelation that God tabernacles with men, he is with man, and uh, he is the light of the city. And so this was a prophecy pointing to even though man would fall, but yet God made that prophecy that we could look back to and, and understand by this appearance. So there is a purpose of, of, uh, of this human form, or this form, this human form of God walking with Adam in the cool of the day. So it wasn't a voice echoing through the, the forest of the garden. It was, it was like this Melchizedek that met Abraham walking in the cool of the day. So Melchizedek now is this human form and how that Christ, when he takes on human flesh, will be made unto this likeness that the bread and the wine. This, see, Melchizedek is a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. Now, this is why tithing, by the way, is a New Testament practice. It, was, it had nothing to do with Abraham because 430 years before uh, Moses in Mount Sinai, uh, uh, the, the tithe was already established. And what the tithe symbolized, it was a testimony that he is alive, there uh, he uh, liveth, as it states there in verse uh, 8. But here men that die receive tithes, but there he, referring to Christ as Melchizedek, receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. So this, the tithe even today that is given is a testimony of the fact that we believe that our high priest is a de indeed alive by virtue of the resurrection and is at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for you and I. And, and that is where the tithe comes from, and that is the purpose of the tithe. In reality, the purpose of the tithe is not so much to pay the bills, but the purpose of the tithe is a demonstration of an individual's belief system that they believe that the Messiah is alive. And by human nature, we invest in that which, which we believe in. Whether a person believes in a, per, a certain stock or they believe in a company, uh, they'll invest in it. Now, you and I, we believe in redemption. And so this is a manifestation where faith is justified by works. And so a person would tithe to that purpose that he indeed is alive. And that's, again, why the tithe belongs to the aspect of redemption. It, it, you, know, you know, myself, I have a hard time. Uh, when we say, hey, you know, we got people, let's take the church money, go out and buy pizza and uh, do this or do that. No, I have, I have a hard time doing this. I, I believe that uh, the, the tithe, it ought to be directed toward the redemptive work of Christ and that we uh, have a place that where the covenant is taught 
And yes, we would pay the heat, uh, the bill, the, the, the electric bill, and uh, we would pay the necessities that we might be able to teach the Word of God, but to take it and say, hey, we're going to give you a $100 gift certificate if you bring a visitor, or we're going to buy you a bicycle if you bring a visitor. I have a hard time with that because the purpose of the tithe ought to be a redemptive uh, quality and connected to redemption. And so uh, that, that's why I, I just, it, it troubles me immensely that we would take the tithe and use it for something of a frivolous nature as that. And, but we need to use it for the redemptive work of Christ and uh, for that purpose. And, and that's, my, that's how I feel about it when I understand what the tithe is. But nevertheless, uh, tithing is New Testament practice. It is not Old Testament. What is Old Testament is that the priesthood of the Levites were established and that they were in a... Uh, they, as a metaphor, would act as though the high priest carrying forth the ceremony, and all of these had a meaning to them, pointing to the Messiah coming. And they did receive the tithe, but the tithe, in essence, though, to, uh, as it was with Abraham, it, it deals and revolves around, it hasn't gone away, because it was before the law, and it's still after the law as we understand the purpose of the tithe and, and the redempted work of Christ. And so when I tithe, when I give a 10% of my income, it's a demonstration of my faith that he indeed is alive. And, and we believe in that kind of investment. And so we're able to assemble together and we're able to help uh, get the gospel out and we teach people and others would be partakers of this benefit. But let's look at another one here tonight. And um, I, I don't want to go through all of them. But I do want to go through uh, one here in particular. Now, we see that in regard to uh, Melchizedek, number one, he had without earthly parents, therefore he was, uh, he's not mortal. Number two, uh, that he had neither had a beginning of days nor end of life. He was self-existent, therefore he was divine. Number three, he was made like unto the Son of God. Um, evidently, to foreshadow, to, to typify the office of the king priest that the word as the son of God was uh, to uh, fill forever. And uh, he abides continually as a priest forever and uh, so forth. Now, I want to give you one more and, uh, and I think we'll go ahead and close with this. And I know we can deal with Abraham and how the, uh, Christ came to meet him, uh, but I do want to deal with uh, the subject of uh, the fiery furnace here. Let's go on the back page, number seven. And I want to read you a statement in regard to uh, what, Ar what Arrhenius said. Now let's read number seven. Number seven, in human form, he walked in the burning, burning fiery furnace with the three Jews and delivered them and thus foreshadowed his office as the Emmanuel Savior Redeemer of his people. It was not human flesh or nature that the word took upon himself in these theophanies. For he must needs be born of woman to have uh, taken upon himself the flesh and blood like our own. They were bodies which he created at his will and which he dismissed at his pleasure and seem indeed to illustrate the real nature and in his incarnation and in our nature, the soul or person which animated those bodies was purely divine, the word, the second person of the Trinity. Now, what I want to look at is in regard to what he said, uh, in regard to the, uh, the three men, uh, as we would know, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Now, without reading the passage there, we know what Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar built an image. And now remember in the book of Daniel, how that Nebuchadnezzar uh, lifted up with pride, and how that... Uh, he built an image of gold, and this image was so tall and so wide. And if anyone would not bow down to worship this image, what happened is that they would be cast alive into the fiery furnace. Uh, when the cornet was played and all the instruments, they would bow and worship, but Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego would not do so. Now, what I want us to look at is um, what Irenaeus said. Now, we're going to close with this, but let me give you this. Now, Arrhenius, again, let me introduce who he is. Now, Arrhenius was a disciple of, uh, he heard Polycarp teach. Polycarp was ordained by John, who wrote the Revelation. 
And he pastored the church of Smyrna. Polycarp was 80 some odd years old when he was burnt alive. A great story about this martyr's death and what took place. But Arrhenius was a Baptist and Arrhenius was one of the early church fathers and uh, he wrote five books, and he dealt a lot with Gnosticism. He dealt a lot with false cults in his day. But he also dealt much in regard to the coming of Antichrist. He talks about the Roman Empire being divided and partitioned up into ten, where he called the ten kings. And there he understood what that was in the book of Revelation, where it talks about the ten kings. And these ten kings are the partitioning of Rome, which would be the ten kings in Europe. Now, in Arrhenius' day, that has not yet been fulfilled because Arrhenius, he died in 202. He was born in 130 A.D. So, not long after the time of Christ, Arrhenius came on the scene. And not long after the apostolic era, Arrhenius was born. But let me deal with uh, in regard to what he said about the fiery furnace and the prophecy, what it pointed to. Now, uh, let me go ahead and read now. And therefore, when the, uh, this is what uh, Irenaeus writes. He writes about, he calls it the apocalypse. He doesn't call it the revelation. He calls it the apocalypse of John. And now, you and I here at Shiloh, we understand the revelation is not Daniel's 70th week. Now, a lot of folks today believe it's Daniel's 70th week, and Daniel's 70th week most likely begins in chapter 4 by the rapture. And then you'll have the seven years of tribulation, Christ coming back in Revelation 19. Now, this is all new doctrine. This, again, is new. Any, I've challenged people to do it, but, but a lot will not do it. I've said, now, find anything written down from 9, uh, 1834 and back that states the revelation this way, and you will not find it. This, the new revelation theory came from Edward Irving, then John Darby, and then Schofield, and then it came later in uh, the 1900s. Primarily in the, uh, in the 1970s, it really gained a lot of uh, traction with uh, Hal Lindsey's uh, late great Planet Earth book, and also 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Come in 1988. But the, the old... The church fathers didn't believe the revelation that way. Now, the revelation is a church book, what the church is going through. And that's what Irenaeus is stating here. So we have to, I, I say that so you understand the writing here. Now listen to what he said. And therefore, when in the end the church shall, shall suddenly be caught up from this, it is said, there shall be tribulation such as not been since the beginning, neither shall be. For this is the last contest of the righteous in which they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. Now, what we're going to read further, Irenaeus has the church in the Revelation there with the ten kings, what in chapter 12 and uh, 13, 11, 12 and 13, the church is, will be put to flight during this time. And this is dealing with the Roman Empire. So again, it's going to be a different uh, look at prophecy than what most people are taught today. But now, he says this, and there is therefore this beast. When he comes, a recapitulation made of all sorts of iniquity, of every deceit, in order that all apostate power flowing into and being shut up in him may be sent into the furnace of fire. Fittingly, therefore, Shall his name possess the number 666, since he sums up his own person, all the commixture of wickedness which took place previous to the deluge due to the apostasy of the angels. For Noah was 600 years old when the deluge came upon the earth, sweeping away the rebellious world. For the sake of the most infamous generation which lived in the times of Noah, and Antichrist also sums up every error devised idols since the flood, together with the slaying of the prophets and the cutting off of the just. For that image, which was set up by Nebuchadnezzar, had indeed a height of 60 cubits, while the breadth was six cubits, on account of which Ananias, Azarias, and Mizael, these are Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, when they did not worship it, were cast into the furnace of fire, pointing out prophetically by what happened to them 
The wrath against the righteous shall arise towards the time of the end. It is still clear the light has John in the apocalypse indicated the Lord's disciple what shall happen in the last times. And concerning the ten kings who, who then shall arise, among whom the empire which now rules the earth, the Roman Empire, shall be partitioned, which is the partitioning there in Europe. He teaches us that the ten horns shall be uh, which are seen by Daniel, telling us that thus it had been said to him, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as yet, but shall receive power, as if kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and give their strength and power to the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, because He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. It is manifest, therefore, that of these potentates, He who is to come shall slay the three, and the subject that the remainder to His power, and that He Himself the eighth among them. And they shall lay Babylon waste and burn them with fire, and shall give their kingdom to the beast, and put the church to flight." So when you read there in the Revelation dealing with the ten kings, now we're further toward the end of the apocalypse, and how that, that Irenaeus, ironically, he refers to Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And how that there are, uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, Behold, were there not three cast in? I see four loosed and walking around, and behold, the fourth is like unto the Son of God. Now, what this uh, human form, this manifestation here of the Son of God walking in the midst of the fiery furnace is a prophecy concerning the time of the Antichrist uh, that will persecute. And we know who the Antichrist is. It's the papacy and the ten kings and the Roman Empire and the Church of Rome. And how that Christ will be with his people and that in the end there will be a time that man has never known. And how that in the end, the church will be put to flight. But then as we remember, it said, the church shall suddenly be caught up from this. In that he said, for there shall be tribulation such as not since the beginning, neither shall be for the last contest of the righteous, in which when they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. So the, the last contest of the righteous with the wicked. And this is where the persecution will come in and how that Christ prophesied and that was the purpose of the appearance of this, the Son of God there in the fiery furnace. That how this great image is a picture uh, pointing to the time of the 666 uh, referring to this system, the Antichrist, the man of sin and the church of Rome and the persecution that would come. And how that these ten nations, uh, these ten kings, and how that the church will be put to flight, and yet he will be with his people. And then as we understand, even as in the garden, that he again will tabernacle with his people and walk with them in the garden in the cool of the day. So all these appearances that we have of Christ in the word of God, in these human form appearances, they all had a prophetic purpose. And those purposes are to be seen and understood in a prophetic manner. Now, some have been fulfilled and some have not. But uh, that, that is what we're looking at in regard to these. So I wanted to just, I, I'm going to go ahead and close with those. But uh, so anyhow, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'll bless the word.